overload where <laughs> you just you take in so much and you, you you're trying not to forget anything and that's what happened to me every place we went it was just I wasn't even touching the ground right. you know we walked for miles and but I don't remember that part it was just um, an education to say the least not just in biblical terms but in history um, there were so many people um, that we met from uh, our group was all over the country but um, in the churches uh, the the people from all over the world I heard every language that I had ever heard and then some there was Buddhist monks and uh, priests and Coptic people and I don't know who all was there and we were just hanging on to each other you know and and we just tried to go with the flow but there was so much peace in the air and no matter what there was people with rifles of course there was good security but that was off to the side the main thing was the the harmony at least at that time in that place in old Jerusalem when we went to the wall especially um, you know people from all over the world and that's what not counting all the other sites that we saw and things that we did it was just the the people coming together for the same reason yeah. maybe with a different approach or a different attitude but we were there yeah. you know and it left me with a feeling like, well, you know, maybe there's hope for us all after all. <laughs> you know, Amen. I'm sure there is. But yeah. we did, uh, we went to Tel Aviv, and then we went up the coast to, uh, like, Haifa. We went to um, G G Capernaum, uh, Caesarea first, in Herod's Palace on the coast. And then we went up the valley. And, oh, we went all the places, all the sites. <laughs> we went to this uh, Sea of Galilee, went for a boat ride. And um, there was fish in the water, like Peter was fishing, and we looked. And uh, we, our guide, I'll say, was a, um, we didn't know. It was just a random choice of our group and our guide when we got there. But he, um, he was really smart young man he was a uh, a major in the israeli army so we were well organized yeah. and and he had connections right and he was a good leader so that helped keep us all focused and on the move but still uh all the information that he gave us the history the things that i i was always a student of history but i found out how much i did not know <laughs> When you got yeah. over there, yeah, boy, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. It's, it's, there's just so much. And it, it was, um, oh, we were baptized in the Jordan yeah. River. Nice. And that was something else. That lifted me up another couple of feet <laughs> off the ground. You know, I thought, man, I'm on my way. And it just, we went to the Dead Sea and the Masada, all those places yeah. I read and heard about my whole life that my grandmother told me the stories, you know, and we walked where Jesus did and, with the cross and we went to the the, the way th yeah the via della rosa the way of the cross and through the old city we went there three days all together yeah. and just went through all the gates and learned as much as we could of course we bought a few things too sure. <laughs> should we should we see if lonnie's got anything to say yeah. stay there i'll come over here to her come I, on over here i will try my best to speak <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, at first day we went to Cana, where the first first miracle sign that God uh, Jesus performed, and I was when I read the Bible, I said, "Oh, we were there. That we were in that place that, and then the the water turned into wine, and then I I can't relate in that, and then when as if I was there, and then when uh, Jesus." Uh, Mary, they were attending to the wedding, and they were invited, um, Mary and Jesus, Jesus Christ, and also uh, his disciples. And, and Mary said that the wine, uh, no, no more wine. 
<laughs> no more wine. And then, and then Jesus said, Jesus said, oh, dear woman, uh, do not involve. Why are you involved in, in me? And then, and then, uh, and then just, it's not my time yet. <laughs> Jesus said. And then, and then Mary said that, oh, just do what he says. So. At that time, uh, that's what the first day. And then we went also to Beaut um, Mount of Beatitudes. Beatitudes, yes. Beatitudes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then we went to, uh, we went to the Gal Sea of Galilee where, the, where the go we went boating. And then the, we, the, our tour guide uh, point the side, uh, mountain side of the Sea of Galilee where where Jesus uh, teaches teach the, uh, the his followers or the people there, and then that he 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 feed the he feed Jesus feed the five thousand. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Did you eat a Saint Peter's fish. <laughs> oh yeah, the tilapia. <laughs> tilapia with the head on and the eyeballs looking at you. That was the first the first feast yeah. of the first Christ Christianity, and then. And then when Jesus Christ and his disciple uh, Jesus was tired, he he he, uh, he went to the to the lake, the mount on uh, the lake, and he walked to the to the water. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. What was your favorite part of the whole trip? Favorite place. Favorite place. Oh, the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee. It's yeah. very pretty there, isn't it? Yeah, we saw that mountainside where. Jesus Did you guys stay overnight in Tiberias? Yeah, we went to Tiberias. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, and then we went to Golgo Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. We went to Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jesus was born. where Jesus was born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And he Nazareth. grew up in Nazareth. Correct. And then, and then when we enter our bus, enter in Jerusalem, we call it the Palm Sunday Road. Right. Oh gosh, the, <laughs> there's the music of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, because Jesus was not, was not. Uh, what is it? He is not. Oh, it's in English. <laughs> yeah, it's where he approached the city on the foal of a donkey. It's yeah. coming off of it's from Bethany. Road. Yeah. He 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 he. It's a long road, and wow, well, well, he is not. Uh, he is not accepted in yes. his own country right. in Jerusalem. Yeah. So we now did you guys did you guys take communion in the Garden of Gethsemane? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we awesome. we went to Isn't that beautiful? We communion. the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. yeah, and then you guys went to the upper room. Yes, yes, Pastor. We went to upper right. room. Will you give and them a hand? Pastor, oh yeah, go ahead. To the, the the house of of the Peters, yes. Peter, yes. where yeah. her her mother in law. Mother -in -law. He, That's right. He healed his mother his yeah. mother in law. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So we appreciate you guys. We love you. Thank you for the report. That's awesome. Good job. That's the first time I've ever been kosher, I guess. I, <laughs> I didn't have a choice. You know? Yeah. That's right. And they, they beat all the blood out of your meat, so it's dry as leather. But uh, the rest of the stuff's pretty good. The fruit, the veggies, and all that good stuff is awesome. The produce, it's excellent. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Marilyn, I want you to come and give a testimony of the goodness of God. Um, you know, Harvey and Marilyn, they do love each other, and normally they sit by each other and are married. <laughs> she just needs a little space today. <laughs> come on up here. <laughs> but I've, I've been in the loop basically from their whole relationship, from its beginning, its inception, to its progress, and all the people that wanted to give advice and gave advice and heard all the advice and followed up and knew that it was the real deal and knew it was your, both in both of your hearts. And I've watched all that progress and been a part of all that discussion. And so married her, brought her back, but there's a little hitch in the process. I want her to tell you what the hitch was and the outcome in the goodness of God. Amen. Well, the, the itch was that when I came to the airport the last time, um, they just looked at my passport, said, welcome, and let me through. Well, when we went up there for the green card interview, um, the lady told me that 
I came in to the country um, illegal because I came on a visitor's passport visa that stated I was already married to a different man and now I'm here claiming I'm married to this man. So I'm a, a convict who need to be shipped back home. How did I get in the country? So I told her that I did no such thing. We didn't know I came upon my visitor's visa because that's the only visa I had. And I had my marriage license to say, if you guys say anything to me, I will just say, here I am, in your face, don't speak to me, I'm married. <laughs> well, <laughs> if that had happened, they would have put me back on the next plane and sent me home because I should have a visa stating I'm now married to Harvey, which is a U.S. citizen. Well, I didn't. Well, God had me walk through the airport. They didn't touch me. They didn't even see me. All they did was said, welcome, and I, you know, I came in. Anyway, long story short, the lady gave me all of that, but when she was looking at my paper, she wanted more documents to prove we were really married. So she asked um, about the age difference. She said, well, what did your people say? I said, well, they love Harvey. He's been coming to Jamaica for almost three years, and they know him, and my church love him. And she said to Harvey, what did your kids say? He said, well, they were a little bit, uh, but, you know, they love Marilyn, and we all get together. And, you know, then she said, um, I don't know. What about we need more documents to prove that you're married? We brought up there a bank account, giant account. We bought a car in December and everything, or marriage license. What more did you need? Anyway, I gave her my um, social security. She goes, you have a social security card? I'm like, yes, I've been to Homeland Security three times. Three times they checked me out. I got my um, social security, I got my working permit, and now you're saying that I can't be here, I'm not legal, with the same documents that I got my social and my working permit. So I know the devil wanted to, to, to shift me, to sift me. Anyway, the Lord appointed me the first time I was here to go to North Carolina. Um, that was the first place I came when my foot touched U.S. soil. We had already made the plan for me to, for us to go back. And I said, Harvey, I'm not going. I have my social security. I'm going to get a job. I need to work. I need some, you know. But the Lord said, no, that's not what I said. You need to go to North Carolina to finish the work that I've already started. That is the closure of why you're here. You're here to be a minister. You're here to do my work, not to do your work. So anyway, I said, Harvey, you know what? I'm not going back. I'm not going to school. I'm going to North Carolina because he had already booked the ticket and everything. And he said, hoo-hoo. So we went. <laughs> It was a wonderful time. Signs, a miracle, a lot of prophecy. You know, and, and a young girl turned to me and said, well, don't, God said you're worrying about something. Don't worry, it's already done. I'm like, yeah. Well, I came here in service Wednesday night, and Carolyn said to me, Marilyn, I got a word from God. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what? No, Lord. And she said, God said to tell you, you're worrying about some stuff. Don't worry, it's already done. Okay. So we went home on Wednesday night. Thursday, uh, not feeling so well. I was down. But I realized that when I'm down and feel so sad, there's something coming at the end. So Harvey brought the letters in, and he kind of rubbed them on my shoulder. Didn't pay me any mind because I was like, mm. And he said, Marilyn, look. So I looked on it, and I saw Homeland Security. I'm like, I don't want to open this, God. Is this my boat out of, out of the U.S. to get out of our country? I'm like, God. And I said, okay. So Harvey ripped them because he realized I wasn't going to do anything. And he started reading. Uh, and then he started saying, Marilyn, you're um, approved. And I'm like, what? So I grabbed it for him. <laughs> and I started reading. <laughs> and I got two um, green, green cards, the I-148, which is my change of status, and I got my I-130, which is my green card for five years. They both came in the mail at the same time. The two, um, the two words, a prophecy from Carolina and, and Caroline, they were true. So I'm now full-fledged legally to be here. Legally, <laughs> I'm, I'm just elated. I'm happy. You know, all the prayers went out and went up, and I thank you. I thank you, my family. Yeah. Pastor wrote a letter. I was saying to Harvey, anybody read a letter the pastor wrote, they would just say, 
go ahead. It was a letter from God. It was a man of God talking honestly from his heart about somebody that he knows, about a good worker, a good person of God. And it's good when you have a good report and somebody can speak honestly. And God knows it's the truth because God loves the truth. And I thank God today for you. And I thank God for my family here. I won't ever stray. I would always be in this place because you are my family. I thank God for you. Woohoo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Marilyn. She just got the seat warmed up for Jeff. So Jeff's going to come up and share the word with us. Would you give him a great big hand? I, I so appreciate our sons in the faith, he and Chewy and others that God is raising up in our midst. I mean, you know, it's about generational church. Amen. It's what God's doing. I'm so glad that John, Mark, and Holly and Mindy are in here today. They're part of the next generation. And it's not we're throwing out the old and just bringing in the new. It's us together accomplishing the purposes of God. So I talked to Harvey in Maryland, and I said, uh, tell me about your trip to North Carolina. They told me about God, what was God was doing supernaturally and depositing gold in teeth and diamonds in teeth and other cool things that were happening, miracles and whatnot. And he says, we did a fire tunnel. I says, you know what? We've not done a fire tunnel for a while. We need to do one. Would you be willing to come and be a part of a fire tunnel this Sunday? They said, yeah. So when Jeff's done preaching, we're going to do a fire tunnel today. We're just going to stir up what God wants to activate. How many of you know? You give away what you get that releases more. So we want more on our house and more in what God is doing. And so we appreciate also what John and Lonnie got to go to Israel and just receive from them what God's done by testimony and thanksgiving. God's good. Are you all wired up, buddy? Cool, man. Go for it. All right. I had to mute it because I could hear an echo between the two. All right. Well, I got a few props I got to set up here. All right. One of my coworkers says that when I do paperwork, I take up all the desks when I set up my stuff. <laughs> He's like, well, I just, it's all organized. Because when I do it, then I work towards the inside, and it all slides where it goes. He's like, I just hate being when you're in here, Jeff, because your paperwork is on my desk, and it's on your desk, and it's on, because we have like an, an L shape. And so I've got some paperwork here and some paperwork here. And he's just like, Ugh, I try and get out of the room when you're, when you're here. <laughs> so um, my title I was kind of thinking about it and I really don't usually have titles for most of my messages but I just have one just so that you guys have one so my title for today is 120 or bust and uh, uh, my main text for today is uh, Exodus 4 uh, 10 through 17 Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue, the Lord said to him. Who gave man his mouth, who makes him deaf or mute, who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he, as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. Now, there's a, there's a stereotype that basically our entire life... Uh, that in your teens and 20s, this is when you make all your big mistakes. You know, you try new things, you, you, know, you get in trouble, and you mount up a pile of debt doing stuff you shouldn't have done. Just all That's when all the big mistakes happen. And then, you know, hopefully you start settling down in your 30s. You start, you know, building your family. You have a, you're hopefully finding a career, not just a job. Um, you know, and then as, as time progresses in your 40s and 50s, you start sending out your kids to school and into the workplace, and they, the cycle continues in their generation, and hopefully they find a career, not a job, and, you know, on and on. You know, and then by, you know, your, your 50s, you're, you know, you're assuming you're kind of, you settled yourself into work, and, you know, by 60, you know, the, the theory and the hope is that, you know, retirement's coming up that hopefully you get there, that eventually you're going to be able to sit on your porch and drink iced tea and 
<laughs> go to places you've never been and, you know, borrow your grandkids for a weekend and uh, take them back. <laughs> and Moses, you know, he could have seen that he was in this life. He's 80 years old. You know, it's really self-imposed exile. He was, uh, you know, herding sheep, lowliest of jobs that you can have. He went from really went from penthouse to the outhouse. Yeah. You know, he went from ready to take control of of uh, Egypt, have anything he wants. No, you know, there's n- there's nothing that he couldn't have thought of that he couldn't have gotten. And he's sitting there, you know, doing what he'd been doing for 40 years, thinking, eh. Life's kind of grinding down, winding down. And God decides to reach out and say, uh, hey, life's really just beginning for you now. It's not ending. Everything that you thought you knew, everything you thought you've seen, that was neat, but that was just a tune-up. You knew nothing up to this moment. But, you know, he he really wasn't going to have any of it. He's like, I can't speak. I can't do anything. Oh, I'm nervous. Can't do any of this stuff. Well, God knew that was baloney. Because he was instructed. He was probably, he was incredibly learned. Because they taught him how to, if he was going to become a pharaoh, he had to learn how to be one. So whatever there was available, he had access to it. Anything he wanted to know, he could know it. So he was trying to weasel his way out of it. He was trying to, oh, God, oh, God, I can't do anything. I'm just so nervous. But I was wondering in the back of my mind, is this real fear that past burden of the, the murder of the, the soldier that was, you know, beating the, the Israelite that he managed to kill, that was he still dwelling on this thing, that really his exile was because he feared the repercussions, even though where his stature was and where he was in, in that kingdom, he could have killed anyone or anything and had zero repercussion. It's not like today where there's, you know, you can impeach somebody and get them out of office and do whatever. But with him, he could have done anything. He could have done it in public in front of a thousand people and everybody would have gone, yay, how exciting. (laughs) You know, we use the term over the hill to jokingly term where our parents and grandparents are in in their stage of life. But what I've started seeing in my family and in this church body is that really, Once down that hill, there's another hill waiting in front of us to climb. But it's a choice whether or not we're going to climb it or if we're going to go, oh, this is too hard. But that, that retirement from a job is not retirement from life. That when we moved back here in 1985, my grandfather would have been about 65 years old, so he would have just hit retirement. Had a 104-acre farm, did about a million other things because farming didn't pay the bills. And so all I basically remember my grandfather is his retirement, which was usually a one- to two-acre garden. He was always cutting wood and building fires and repairing this and repairing that and doing projects I never understood, but they had a purpose, I guess. <laughs> and... Uh, and, uh, but for him, that was retirement. I don't think the man probably worked less than 40 or 50 hours a week in retirement. But uh, the one thing, and I brought a couple of my props here that I'm going to get out now. When uh, he died 13 years ago, I asked my mom for two things. I asked for his Bible, and I asked for his knife. This is one of his Bibles, not the one that, not his last one. But this is what I asked for. The thing's beat up. It's got his notes in it. Because the thing I remember about my grandfather is how much he studied the word at night. You know, I look for a date to see how old this is because the cover's falling apart. And it's interesting because I was kind of studying it yesterday to see, like, what, what did he care for? How did he, how did he treat his Bible? What did he write in it? And I noticed that all of his notes were at the front of the Bible, and the few that he had in the Bible were in pencil. And I was thinking, I was like, is that, was that his respect for the word? I don't know. Because then I've seen some of his later Bibles, and they've got writing all over them. But uh, it got me thinking. It's like, you know what? The verses he's got in the front, I need to look these up and see what was important to him at that time. What was it that this meant to him? <coughs> and the knife, this was the other thing that I wanted. That uh, in his garden, uh, and I especially remember at night, he had, I mean, it was zucchini and apples and everything else. But at night when 
when you know we'd kind of wound ourselves down at five or six or seven and during the summer you know it's still light until nine so he'd be out there until eight and we'd kind of go walk out there and he'd go pick a tree pick an apple or something off the tree and he always use his knife and cut it up and he always you know he was one of those masters of the knives where he could like peel it and do all these like sort of tricks with it and cut it and cut it up and go here you go and that's why i have this because that was my remembrance of him how much he loved loved the word and how hard he worked and that's what these two remembrances are for me. And I haven't opened that. I haven't opened this Bible like ever. It was really hard when I got it because, I mean, you know, he just died. And my mom kind of asked the question, is there anything of his that you want? And that's what I wanted. And, uh, and so I, it, was, it was kind of a, a flashback, and it kind of, like, hit me for a minute. And I was like, ugh, like bringing old things up that hadn't been brought up in a long time. And... Uh, but it was good because it was it was it was good memories, um, you know. And Social Security office says that you can retire 65, 67. And eventually, it's going to get moved to 70. Well, if Moses was called at 80, that means if we actually retire in that 65 to 67 window, that we've got like 15 to 13 years to like play around and find what God wants to do, make mistakes, head directions. You know, think we may go one way, but kind of, you know, where are we going to go in this new stage of life? You know, we talk about, oh, if I, you know, I hear people go, man, if I was 20 or 30, I wouldn't make these mistakes again. Well, this is like a rebirth. This is a new set of 20s and 30s. You know, you've got a chance. You don't have, you know, if you don't have your 9 to 5 in your way, you can, you can correct some of these mistakes or you can try new things. Don't just, you know, don't just, you know, don't just sit, tune in and tune out. Um, I want to, I'm going to read one, but we're going to go to 1 Timothy uh, 5, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to read one right after. Uh, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger uh, women as sisters with absolute purity. And then I'm just going to read it here. Um, fifth commandment, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I was listening to, and I can't remember which one of the messages I was, I was listening to, but um, <clears throat> the preacher said, are you saved, but are you still a slave? Are you still a slave to your past? That you may be, you, you know, you may be saved from this life so you can go to the next but are you still grappling with issues that you know you've been dealing with for a while? You know what's what's your self-imposed curse? And that you know when you put negative words into your own life that I can't do this, I you know just the, the uh, you know the any long list of the I can'ts. But not to pick people out of the crowd. And the one thing that I, that that I find is that there's really at some point, a stage in life, and I can't tell you when it begins, but I can almost tell you when it ends. But there's a stage that says, I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> right. And I was, and I'm thinking to myself, and I'm writing this, what is the curse of your age? Yeah. And this is a Western mindset, because you go to Asia, they, you know, anybody that's older, s respect until the day they die. Right. But we have a self-imposed curse that as we get older, yeah. there's something wrong with that, right. inherently wrong. So when I said before, when we come down that hill, if you have these self-imposed cur curses, you will not begin to climb that next mountain. You will settle. It's too hard. There's something wrong with me. There's something I can't do. You know, I say it all the time. The great commands is love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love yourself, how can you love others? Or at the, you know, the measure that you, at the measure you use for yourself, that will be measured back to you. Posed on yourself. Proverbs 16.31 says, Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. That, you know, I read a lot of things about a lot of things. And <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, I just got random facts in my brain all the time. But I was, I was reading a few months back that said that if you have Say three individuals all take an IQ test, get the exact same amount right. And 
I've got a good age gap here. So if Chewy took the test, I took the test, Bob took the test, that if we all took it, scored the exact same, who would have the highest score? It wouldn't be a tie. Bob would have the highest score. And the answer is because IQ, it measures potential and how much you, over time, remember. Because of course when you go to school and you have the same tests and the things that are beat into your head every day, you're going to remember it for a time. I took German in high school. Don't remember a lick of it. <laughs> but you know, for the kids that are there that are taking it, even if they're going to be in my place and don't remember it, they've at least got more in their brain right now than I do. So that's why Bob, if he remembers the same answers to the same questions, he scores more. Because what it means is over time, he's remembering it, he's using it, it's active in his life. And, uh, you know, I was really only told a couple of times in my life, respect your elders. It wasn't like one of those things that was just beat into my head all the time. That, it was, you know, told a couple times. But then in my, my parents' lives, I really saw that active. Because, like I said, my grandparents had a farm, and we lived in the city. So during the summer and holidays and all that sort of stuff, we spent them out of my grandparents' farm. Help them, helping them do whatever. And now, you know, my grandmother just turned 92. So my main support system for my grandmother is my mother because my uncle, who's the oldest, lives in Indiana. So a lot of this falls on my mom. And the, the one thing, too, is that um, if it's not my mom, I get the next phone call. And, you know, the one thing that I don't, it doesn't bother me and it doesn't annoy me, but the one thing that that I don't like when my grandma says is, oh, I hope I'm not bothering you. <laughs> and it's like, Grandma, you've done so much in my life for everything that you've done. You can, and I tell her this all the time, and I don't know if she just forgets or she this just her way. But I say, Grandma, there is not a single thing that you can't ask me to do that I will find time to get it done. No matter how busy I am, I'll get it squeaked in. <laughs> She's like, I know, but I don't want to bother you. And she, you know, she lives like a quarter mile down the road. And she knows I work a million hours, and I've got a lot going on, and all my kids and on and on. But because of all that she's done in her past and continues to do and, you know, all's going on, I, there's not a thing I won't drop to get it done for her. If I can do it or I'll find out who I need to find out that can get it done for her. You know, and, and even the phrase, you know, if you do not work, you will not eat. We quote this to our kids all the time and all those living off this system. But I'm, I'm beginning to think, too, is that as we grow older, we need to self-analyze and move this into our life, that not that you're not going to figuratively eat, that you're not, you know, Grandma, at 92, get out there and get a job. <laughs> it's that your life's, not, your life's not over. You're not just like, you're not waiting to see Grandpa in heaven. That's not like right. your, your sole purpose for being. That, that, you know, you're eating is, it's spiritual food. It's not one of those things where you turn 65 and I'm done reading the Bible. Or I'm done going to church. Good. Or I'm done, you know, all the things that could be, oh, I'm done with this. And that there isn't like an allotted time that we just like, we just shut down. And they're like, all right, I'm going to watch. You know, my, my grandma loves Murder, She Wrote. So she's not going to spend the next 20 years watching all the reruns of Murder, She Wrote. Even though for Christmas I bought her the complete collection on DVD. <laughs> but... You know, and I saw one of the most one of those motivated people. I was reading about it um, on one of the news sources. There was about a ye six months to a year ago. There was a 92 year old lady who who was the oldest person to complete a marathon. She did it in six and a half hours, and her grandson ran with her. And uh, um, that was, you know, for safety's sake. If I mean, she falls or something happens at 92, I mean, she was very aware of how fragile she could be if she fell. But she got to the end, so she now has a world record for fastest time because she's the only one that's done it at 92 <laughs> but you know it's it's you know it's motivating then I that for me I'm very I'm very aware that that where things are now things are going to get God's kind of set things in motion that things get stronger people can do more see more be more as each generation passes along so I look at 92 and go you know what that means realistically at 100 I could do this I may still have to take a grandchild with me. 
but I could still get this done. Yeah. You know, at the end of Joshua's life, you know, we're really fond of, you know, we quote it all the time that as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. But in that statement, there's more history with that statement. He brings all the tribes of Israel out, and he basically whittles through their entire, you know, what they did, where they've been, where they've gone wrong. And he basically gives, he gives one last warning that, that uh, cause the interesting thing is, is when you get, when you get upright and righteous people in power where they need to be, things go really well and really smooth. But then you take those people out and all of a sudden things kind of turn into whatever that you, you don't realize that there's some people that are just really good at what they do, which is one reason why we need to build up more leaders and more people that can do stuff because then you become so self-reliant on one person. Then you've got all these people by their bedside, don't die, I can't live without you because we're all gonna fall into a big hole. Which seemed to be the tale of like Israel after this. It's like after Joshua was gone, it was like they followed the Lord and then they didn't. And then they followed the Lord and then they didn't. It was like over and over. I just finished going through Judges. And it was just like one story of, and they followed the Lord for 40 years and then they did whatever they wanted. And that's a direct quote. And then they did whatever they felt was right. Great. I've got a lot of people I know that do whatever they feel is right. <laughs> but the one thing that, you know, too, is if you study people, is the ones that remain active after, after retirement, the ones that do that, they tend to be healthier, live longer, have better relationships. Because it's not because it's one thing. It's, it's about stagnation. When God told us to go forth and multiply, it wasn't like do that until 65 and then sit on chill for the rest of your life. Go forth and multiply forever until I call you home. That's right. You know, and with Joshua, when, when uh, he actually was making a prophetic declaration, when he said, for, as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord, verses later was followed by, and then they buried him. So he made a proclamation for what he said his family was going to do, yeah. and it wasn't like, and then Joshua lived for 40 more years, was an upright man, and everybody kind of, everything was great. No, it was, God says, this is where we've been. If you don't stick on this path, this is where you're going. You do what you're going to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Right. See ya. Right. <laughs> and then he died. <laughs> and the one thing, and I noticed too, is that whether we realize it or not, there's, there's a generation of people, and continuing so, that aren't serving the Lord. And it used to be your seniors, your grandparents, those are the ones that at least you could count on. They were the ones following the Lord. Not so much anymore. We have, we have a next generation and two and three following behind that they don't have great relationships with God, if any. It's true. And so we're going to have, an, um, you know, when I used to think of senior ministry, it used to be when we were at the old lighthouse. The seniors had their own class on Sundays where they could be together and they could do their own thing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Excellent. But, like I said before, there's a new mountain that's standing in front of our seniors. And it's seniors serving seniors. Not just in retirement, but finding God. It's a ministry that I don't think we've thought about because we really, I wouldn't say haven't needed it, but it hasn't come to the forefront like it's going to. I wouldn't say we're edging there now, but it's going to come really hot and heavy in the next 20, 30, 40 years. True. That there's going to be men and women that... You know, we can get super stubborn and go, there is no God. But it's like, what's the, what's the saying that um, there are no atheists in foxholes? That's right. That's right. The end of your days when you're sitting in your bed. Yeah. I mean, are you, I mean, I just hard, find it hard to wrap around in my brain. You're going to go, there is no God. I'm just going into space or nothingness or whatever I'm going into. There's got to be at least a 50-50 amount of people in that group, even probably closer to 70-30 or 80-20 that are going, dear God, I made a wrong choice. Yeah. And they're waiting for you or me or for whoever to step right. in and, and let them know about the good news. Because it's because we, we listen all the time about how basically if you haven't made your decision by 12, it gets a lot harder. Yeah. So how much harder is it going to be? You know, I see how it's harder 40s and 50s and 60s, but when you realize that there's a finite amount of time in your life, it's almost like you revert to that 12-year-old or younger. That 
you kind of hit, you hit like a, a plateau of stubbornness, I would guess, at some point. I mean, it's got to be there because at some point, it's you and your maker. Whether you believe it or not, whether you believe in a God, the God, my God, you hit a point in your life at the end and you go, where do I go from here? God's got a built-in mechanism from the day that we were born because he knew each one of us, saved or not saved, before we were born. Which means there's a built-in seed in every single one of us that's, that's calling to God. Satan wants to get it murky and add other things that are called God. But the true God, he's built himself a, a seed, a pure seed inside of every single one of us that is calling to each one of us to make that decision, to know him. And one thing I, I'm just, you know, I process and go, I mean, I used to do deliveries at the hospital. And I can just imagine all those people that are, that are there and facing huge obstacles for whatever surgeries they're having. That, and this isn't to be mean, but I look at the, I just want to, I don't want to say it to anybody, but I can, might think it in my brain. What is, how is your atheism doing now? Yeah. Yeah. You can't tell me you're not scared. Oh, I'm, no, you can't tell me you're not scared. Cain was scared after he killed his brother because he asked because he told God, "Oh God, you know, I you know people are going to find me and kill me after you know what's happened on you know, and I go out into the wilderness or wherever I go." And God said, "No, I'm going to put a mark on you that if anybody touches you, then they're going to die." Which that doesn't seem too comforting because then, you know, great, okay. <laughs> if anybody kills you, then they're dead. Well, but if I'm dead, how is that? I don't know. Cain, Cain's dealing, Cain was dealing with his own issues. But, you know, and I, and, I, and I said earlier that I see, especially in this house, that retirement e doesn't equal stagnation. And I take, for example, our healing rooms. Because for me, I mean, I work all the time. It would be great to come down here and help people, but I just, I don't have time. I mean, I work at 4 o'clock in the morning until like 4.30 at night, nine, you know, five days a week half the time. But when I look at people that I know are in here, and especially because uh, about three weeks ago, Bob was at men's Bible studying, and Bob will recount different things that have happened at the healing rooms. And, and you know, and it's just, and, you know, it's like this one big thing, but it's, it's interesting because it's not just like, we had this one prayer come through. It's never just one. And, um, and it, it'll, be, you know, it'll be story after story after story. But I can guarantee you that it wasn't like Bob hasn't had like the healing rooms on his heart since the day he was born. Bob tells me a lot of intimate stories about his life. And I go, that's not the Bob I know. <laughs> I mean, that's like, like railroad Bob. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't picture any of this stuff. Like, I, I, it's like, he tells me stories about, you know, when he was younger and stuff that's going on, and I'm just like, man, that's not Bob I know. Yeah. But you know what? That also tells me what a changed heart can look like. Yeah. But, you know, but in the healing rooms, I, I, I mean, it's honestly run mostly by seniors. But the thing is, is it gives me hope. And it shows me what the future can look like and what yeah. options are. Yeah. Because the one thing that I see is through diligence of prayer and going to the Lord and repetitive. I mean, because you may have, say you have 20 people come in and nothing happens to 19. But what about that 20th? Yeah. It builds faith. Yeah. And then the next 20, it becomes 15 at 20 and 10 at 20 and 15 at 20. It's a faith act. It's what you guys constantly do and constantly see. It's like, if, honestly, if I've got something going on and I need prayer, you guys are the guys I'm going to. Guarantee it, because you've seen it. You've lived it, you've seen it. Um, Deuteronomy 34-7 30, uh, says that when Moses died at 120, he not only climbed, a, he climbed Mount Nebo so that God could show him everything that was going to happen and where their promised land was. He couldn't go, but he was kind of, you know, God was like, well, that's where it is. There's the promise right there. But that his eyes were not weak, nor his strength was gone. Amen. So he was as strong at 120, at least as he was at 80. 
So he spent 40 years leading really an obnoxious nation of people that <laughs> believed in doubt and believed in doubt. I mean, they were obnoxious. They were. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I want bread. I want meat. I want this. I want that. It's like, it's like all my kids were in Israel for like this 40-year time span. <laughs> but, but I was reading this, and it, and it kind of gave me hope because the other day I was – I ran the Eugene Marathon a couple weeks ago, and I completed it in four hours and 24 minutes. And I've got an eventual goal to run the Boston Marathon, but you have to have a qualifying time to do that. So I looked for where my age was, three hours and 15 minutes. And then I was like, well, man, so with what I ran, where does that put me at? It put me in the 70 to 75-year-old qualifying time. (laughs) And... And I, man, it's like I, sh- I was just like, wow, is that disheartening? <laughs> but then I, but then I went and I like got rid of that real quick. And God said, you know, you've only been running for like a year and a half, but you know what? That's potential. So even if nothing changes, you're going to get there. I mean, I turned 40 in nine and a half more days. And so, so whether or not, so it, <laughs> I've got, so I mean, I've got two options is I keep training and get faster and bring my age group down, or at 70, I'll basically, I'll Abraham my way to get in the Boston Marathon. (laughs) And, uh, you know, all the commencement speeches that started coming out, you know, every, whoever the new famous person is, and they always have quotes and video and whatever is coming up from the, the next commen- commencements. And I heard a really interesting one from Arnold Schwarzenegger at the University of Houston. And first off, I'm like, why is Arnold Schwarzenegger at the University of Houston? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is his connection there? I have no idea. But, but when he gave his commencement, he said that the idea that he's a self-made man is a myth and that the idea that anybody is a self-made man is a myth that all of us have gotten to where we are today because anybody that's had input in your lives for positive or for negative, parents, grandparents, children, coworkers, um, schoolmates, um, pastors, anybody, anybody that's had any effect on your life in passing for moments, they're part of your story. So you may, you know, you may have done a lot of that hard work, but some of your thinking has been turned you know, has had some sort of input in it. And, uh, you know, John 14, 9 says that anyone who has seen me, uh, has seen me has seen the Father. That's right. And I was thinking about this the other day, and it's like really for any of us, but for me I know that really most of you don't know my parents or my grandparents, but I'll tell you I'm a lot like them. Amen. That That's where I get my hard work from. That's where I get my love of the word from. That's where I get, I mean, a lot of who I am was there. It's like, it's like if I have, I mean, I'll take credit for all the bad stuff. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take it all because what I remember from them isn't the negative stuff. It's all the positive stuff. So all the negative stuff that my kids may have about me now, I'll own that because that's me. I'll take it. But John had said something interesting yesterday at men's Bible studies. It's interesting as you kind of grow older and you see your kids, you kind of calm down a little bit. And I kind of noticed that in my parents' lives, too, that my dad's kind of calmed down a little bit, too. But, you know, and it's just interesting because, I mean, I'll just look at certain things and go, oh, my dad does that, or my grandfather did that. And, you know, I've had people ask me, why are you the way you are? Well, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, I had a lady once tell me, she's like, you just go. I'm like, what do you mean you just go? that you, you don't really have like a pause button. You just kind of like go all the time. You're not like hyper fast. You're not slow. You just go. I'm like, well, what is that about? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just kind of built into me. It's just stuff to do, do it. Well, like I said, it works back to what my parents have taught me and growing up on that farm and this and that. I mean, the reason there was no time to, st- I mean, you had like a block of time and man, you had like, snack break occasionally but when there was stuff to do you were kind of racing the heat a lot of the time during the summer 
So, you know, you sit down and like, oh, I'm just going to sit down right now. And then grandpa would go, oh, we got to go do this right now. <laughs> I don't want to do that right now. <laughs> and I think, honestly, that's where a lot of that came from. But I'm trying to, I, wrote, I wrote a couple things down before I got to church, and I'm trying to remember now why I wrote them down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Proverbs 17.6 says, Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. And I just want to tell you, in this, this race to 120, it's not just for you. That I, under, I mean, I understand, you know, I'm up here today because John kicked me out of the nest and told me to get going. <laughs> but the one that, I mean, he did. That's kind of what it was. He's like, you got something to say, say it. Yeah. And, and he, you know, he really, I mean, he doesn't ever, like, tell me what to say or what my topics are or what. He just kind of lets me just, whatever God's got for you to say, just say it. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you, it's like in my life, as you know, I, I'm up here and I progress and move forward and whatever it is that I have, it's not just me running this race in front of all of you. I do take a moment to pause and I need, you know, those of you that stand at the left and right of me, your arm on my shoulder, because there's a, there's, it's a comfort and it's, um, a lot of it is, it's why there's a, if you notice, there's kind of a safety when your parents are around, especially when you're a house. There's kind of a safety to that, assuming, you know, depending on how you grew up, there's a safety there. And for me, with all of you here, and those of you that I know really well and some not as well, but there's a safety net for me. And it's not like um, without or out of flounder, but I, I like knowing that I'm going to come in, and Bob's going to grab me every single Sunday that I come in or Wednesday. Every Sunday, Bob's going to grab me and give me a hug. Every Sunday, I guarantee you. Guarantee you. And each one of you have, like, little things that you do. And I'm, I'm I mean, I, I say a lot up here, but there's a lot that just kind of churns in my brain. And I remember a lot of weird things. I don't remember names, but I remember events. And so I remember things that you guys do that may seem pointless and dumb and and don't think, you know, and don't think about, but I remember those things. So for me, at some point, I may not remember your name, but there's certain little things that each one of you have done or comments that you've made or things that just kind of like, that's how I, you know, that's how I attach to you. So if I ever forgot Bob's name, which I'm never forgetting Bob's name, but <laughs> Bob, that's Hugger Man right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like in Debbie, Debbie's my mom, mom for life. She's, yeah. she's gone through thick and thin with me right. from when I was a teenager. That's right. And, you know, I go down the line, down the line, down the line and talk, and talk to people. And it's interesting that even if you feel forgotten, you're not. Because I'll sit back there or here when I walk in and I, rem I remember things. Or you say things to other people. I'm really good about listening. I wouldn't say listening into conversations, but when you're loud, that's kind of what it turns into. And so I hear things that you're praying for or things that you're hoping for or things that you're doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's just interesting. It's just interesting to, <laughs> just, to hear, just to hear it. And, uh, oh, good, I'm a good time. I need to give myself about 15, 20 minutes. So this is one of my shorter messages. This is about where I'm going to wrap it up. But I got five words to give, and I had to give myself time to do it. And it was, it was interesting. And I got to tell you how I even got, got here that I was reading this book. Um, actually, I heard a message by Sean Boltz. He was, he was speaking s somewhere. I listened to five different message podcasts, and I can't remember because a lot of these guys travel in the same circles, and you hear them in other places. But I was reading his book. It's called Translating God, Hearing God's Voice. I'm going to tell you, I did not like this book. <laughs> Didn't like it. I've read 25 books this year, and this probably ranks as the bottom one or two. <laughs> and <laughs> liked him speaking, but it's like he's, you know, and he's, he, he knows a lot of famous people, and he knows a lot of, but he'd like tell a story, and he's like, I can't give you this person's name because, and for me, I like to get sucked into a story, but if I got to hear for the fourth time, you can't tell me this person's name, I can't, I can't build any connection to anything you're talking about, but it was, but you know, the book's like 150 pages, 160 pages, and he had some good stuff to say, but I get to the end of it, and I'm just like, man, I'm so ready to be done with this book. <laughs> Heard him, you know, I heard his live speech, really good. I was like, man, some people are just not called to be authors. You can be an author and not a good one. And, 
But it was weird in the last 30 or 40 pages, all of a sudden God like gave me all these words all at the same time for a whole bunch of people in here. And I'm like, wow, is that how God works? I can read a book I don't like and get a whole bunch of words for people? Wow, this is amazing. And, you know, normally I can get, normally it'll be like a picture or a sentence or this and that. I've got like a page of stuff I had to write down because I didn't want to forget it. And one, two, three, four, five, no, it's six people. And one of them, uh, and then, you know, I, I, there are people that I'm, a lot of people I'm familiar with and they had questions going on, but I told God, okay, so you give me all these words for all these people, but I need somebody to pick out of the crowd because, man, sometimes it's easy to find words for people that you know because you know where they're going through and God wants to kind of help you in the relationship with them. So I wanted somebody that I, I didn't know but that I hadn't done before. So that's going to be my last one. So my first word was for Joe. And, uh, you know, we were at men's uh, breakfast about three weeks ago. And you were telling me, or you're telling all of us about how, you know, you're kind of grinding your way to retirement and this is going to be your year. But you've got all these people trying to input what Joe should do next. <laughs> Come work another day a week. But, you know, one day a week's going to turn into three. <laughs> and it's going to turn into about five other things. It's not necessarily what Joe wants to do. It's not necessarily, not necessarily what God wants you to do. And so God wants you to make a decision. A decision. And it's a decision only you can make. Do you want to be Joshua or do you want to be Caleb? Joshua, a warrior leader, or Caleb, a warrior? And you basically got till the end of the year to make your decision. And God has a recommendation not which one of these, but how to get to your conclusion. And that's you need to spend about two to four weeks at the end of the year in the beginning at 18 fasting. doesn't matter what it is. You need to pick something to get to your answer. That no matter how many people come into your life and they're going to tell you, Joe should do this, Joe should do that, you need to decide what mountain you're going to climb next because you've got about five. And, you know, I look some more up about Caleb. You know, he was 40 just like Joshua when they said that they could take the land. He was 80. Between 80 and 85, he fought with Joshua retaking the land. At 85, he retired so that he could go get his inheritance and his mountain fighting them off of his inheritance. So wherever this mountain is that's going to lead you, first step is you deciding which mountain you're going to climb. Okay. And that came fast and heavy, and I guarantee that's the right answer. <laughs> guarantee it. Some of these, you know, they're kind of like the, there could be a hundred different directions of what, you know, which way, you know, to get really vague. This wasn't vague. This was pretty specific. Um, I'm going to skip this one because I'll probably get too emotional doing it. Um, John, here's an interesting one for you. I ask, I ask God questions all the time about a bunch of you and why things are, I was like, why is some things just seem really hard in John's life and why some people really just don't like John? I mean, honestly, that's the way the thing is. Why, why are there just some people? And the weird thing is that it's especially people in your generation that don't like you. And God said, and it's true. I mean, I know a lot about John, and I've been through the thick and thin with John, so I know it. And God said that though they know me and my son, like John has a like you always you always tell stories about how your grandmother is the only one that's allowed to call you Johnny. Every one of his children has a different relationship with God. That you have a really heavy relationship with Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. But there's people in your circles that don't know him, don't know that about God. They believe that he is a healer, but they don't have the faith to see it that there are others that their strengths may not be your strengths, but you still have that faith. And that's why it seems like, I wouldn't say people bully you, but the reason that there's that conflict is that there are those that call you, you, you know God by multitudes of names. And there's a lot in your life that limit the names of God. There's pages upon pages upon pages of what God's name is. But there's a bunch of them that limit them. And that's why there's so much conflict with people that come in contact with you. 
is because you know God in some ways, in a more intimate way than they do, and they don't like it. And that came really heavy, really fast last week. Because I, and I mean, like I said, I ask questions and I, and I watch you and I, and I hear about your relationship and I ask God a lot of why questions. Because if you don't, you know, sometimes it's silence. But when it's not about me and it's about others, God tends to kind of like pour his heart out a little bit. Um, move those to the end. Oh, and the, and the word that I had, make sure she's, she's here. I had a word for Lakina. And because like I said, I asked for a word for somebody I've never had a word for before. And it was very strange. And I, had to, I spent 40 minutes trying to research this yesterday as to why this was the word. Because God said that you were my bass. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't know anything about instruments. And... And I looked it up, and I, I, I went online yesterday. I'm like, well, what is the purpose of the bass? The bass guitar, the bass whatever. And I found a guy who gave a really good explanation, because I'm not a musician on any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and this is, what this, guy, this is what this one guy wrote, because somebody asked the same question. What is the importance, function, and purpose of the bass guitar in a rock band? Pretty much the same as the importance, function, and purpose of the foundations in a house. You don't necessarily notice that they even exist most of the time, but if you take them away, the whole house collapses in a heap of rubble. The bass player in a conventional rock band acts as a vital link between the drummer and the rest of the band. They lock in with especially the bass drum and help link the main beat, the main pulse of the music from the dry sound of the drum to the warmer sound of the harmony and melody content, uh, content of the music. They act a bit like glue in this sense or to avoid mixing too many metaphors like the concrete in a house foundation. And so God told me that's who you are. You are a foundation. You're sticky. You're like glue. That you're not just like the rock guitar bass, that you're like a classical bass that they use in you know, classical music. You're like the stand-up bass that they use in jazz. That you're the rock bass. That I, a guy that I was reading in here too said that if you can't hear the bass in a soundtrack, the sound guy is not doing a very good job because you ought to be able to hear it loud and you ought to be able to hear it clear. So that's what God says about you. Be loud, be clear, and then he's going to change. And I, this is the last part. I didn't understand it. Maybe your husband can, like, explain this. But God said he's moving you more complicated from a four-string to a six-string. And then he's going to make you more complicated. Nice. But you're glue. You're a foundation. Without that's Lakina, right. a lot of things are going to fall. Yeah, that's, good. that's the word I got for you. Okay, these are my last two. This is for Bob and Sherry, but for you individually. So Sherry, I've asked you in the last couple of years, and you've never had an answer for me. I've always asked you, Sherry, what do you want to do? And Sherry, you know, she's come to me a couple times and go, I have no idea, Jeff. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what I want to do. Well, and then the answer to that conclusion became very apparent as to why Sherry didn't have a word or didn't have the answer for what this was going to be. It's because if you would have had an answer and started whatever that path was, it was without Bob. And so God's kind of had your heart on pause, I guess would be a good way to put it. That there is a desire, desires in your heart that you now have options and things that you want to do. And much like I said with Joe, there are things that you've got to decide upon. You Like things that you've got to decide upon are how long do you want to work? Do you want, are you at work because you feel like if you stepped away, everything would collapse? <laughs> Do you feel that, mm, I don't know, that a part of you is actually there? But at some point, and I guarantee this is going to happen, you're going to reach a point when you're going to go, I don't need to be here anymore. <laughs> and it's not going to be angry. It's not going to be because of a hurtful experience. It's because you're going to know here that the time is to move on in whatever that is. I don't know what that is, and I can't, like, the one thing is we want God to just, like, God, tell us where my path is. It's a relationship. God wants to know where you want to go. So he may poke at you and show you a couple different options, <coughs> but it's like God just wants to know, what does Sherry want to do? <coughs> 
I don't know. So that's Sherry's word. So Bob, yours is, yours is actually not a word, but it's what I asked God. That's why it's really hard. No, I put it at the end. Put it at the end. <coughs> that when I thought about you know Bob, because I haven't known Bob very long, like two or three years really, is about how long I've known Bob. And I got really selfish, and I said, um, give him at least 20 more. Because I haven't known Bob long enough. And, you know, I hear a lot of people say, remind God of his word and what he says. And I said, God, there was an unclean king that you told him he was going to die, but then when he repented and asked for forgiveness, you gave him more time. So if you can do this for this guy who doesn't love you and doesn't know you, you owe Bob 20. <laughs> so only time will tell. But that's what I ask God for for you because I haven't known you long enough. Not that anything's happening. I just wanted some layer of protection there <laughs> that if he cares what I think and what I feel and that's what I asked for. And that's my last word. And it's two minutes to noon, so I made my time. So, fire tunnel, if that's what, you, if that's what we're doing, let's do it. Should we come put this platform right up here? Help me do that, will you? There you go. Slide it back. Um, do you know where that soaking tape we had from last Wednesday's at? Yeah, which one? You guys know which one I'm talking about? <coughs> Not the Julia True one. That one, yeah. That's the one I want. Please. <coughs> and somebody get me a, a bottle of water, could you? Please. <coughs> I'm like parched here. Thanks. Um, I don't want yours, but thank you. Not that it's bad. I, I have a fresh bottle coming. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> no, we we share spit. Hallelujah. I'm going to add on to the prophetic word that he was giving Joe. <coughs> I've known Joe since I was 18. Joe and Judy both since I was 18 years of age. And uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Both of them were in Bible college. I don't know if you know that or not. So there's always a reason why people do what they do. I don't think it's just because they want to do it, but I think there's a prompting of the Holy Spirit. And I believe those things that stirred in you originally are going to come to fruition and manifestation. That reason why you have the heart and the pit passion to, to go to college is going to come forward in this next season of your life and that you're going to begin to see God work in you and through you <coughs> in ways you never thought imaginable praise God hallelujah <coughs> hallelujah yeah there's some things in my life and thank you Jeff that I've tried to get out of. <laughs> and I know that's I know that's not right. And, you know, I know some directions that God was leading me. And it's all confirmation that, hey, you need to be about my business. And 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 it's now. The time is now. And uh I thank you for years of input. You and your wife have helped mold me what I am. And, I, and this young man, I thank you for being obedient to God. And it's scary because I don't like change. <laughs> I, don't like doing, I don't like doing something new, something that's not unfamiliar. It's, I don't like the stepping out on faith. It's hard. It's hard. It's very hard. But I know that I know that I know that I know that I know 
that God is stirring something. And he's stirring something in this area of town. In this area of town. And it's going to spread like a fire. That fire that you saw in a vision. And it's going to turn into a move of God. And it's going to change our country. It's going to change our nation. And it's going to affect the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Go to Charisma Magazine.